to your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 1. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight on the subject of adversity. Amen. And we've been talking about conflict resolution. But I want to switch gears just a little bit. Amen. Because um, in dealing with adversity, we learn how to deal with conflict. Amen. Because of what adversity brings, which we need this in order to deal with conflict the right way. So, James chapter 1. Let's all stand together. Sorry, verse 1. Pray for me tonight, amen. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count them all joy when you fall into dire temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. Wanting or lacking nothing. May we see. Lord, thank you for this night. Uh, thank you for your goodness. Father, we thank you for your mercy. Lord, we pray that you will bless us now as we once again believe from your word. Father, we pray that you forgive us of our sin. That you will wash us under your shed blood. Lord, help us to turn from our sin, dear God. That we may please you. Lord, bless us now. I pray, dear God, that you will help your people. Lord, I know it's been a busy day, and uh, and we may be a little tired and a little antsy tonight, but Father, I pray that you will put a calmness about us, that we may comprehend and understand your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we rebuke the devil and demand the way. Holy Spirit, help us now. Bless us, guide and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, James chapter 1, it's really something because he said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. In other words, be joyful during adversity. Have you ever gone to somebody when you're going through a tough time and they just kind of look at you and smile and almost in a way of telling you, be joyful, rejoice. How can you rejoice when things are not going right? Amen. A lot of times we adapt the mentality of God is doing something to me instead of doing something for me. Adversity is not God doing something to you. Adversity is God doing something for you. Somebody say amen. amen. Because of what adversity works. Amen. So it says in verse number two, my brother count all joy when you fall into dire temptations. Verse three. Verse three. <laughs> Verse three. You got I'm the fire deacon. Verse three. No, <laughs> but he's my daddy, so I can't fire him. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. Worketh what? Patience. Church, what's another word for patience? Endurance. Endurance. That's right. It worketh endurance. Why is it important for us to be able to endure adversity? Yeah, I hope you came to church ready to talk tonight because I'm not going to do all the talking. Amen. Why is it important that we learn to endure adversity? Okay, good, good, yes. Yeah, that's good because many times instead of us enduring adversity, we try to get out of it. We try to run from it. Uh, we try to stay away from it. Anybody that brings adversity into my life, instead of me trying to endure it and understanding how to work through it, I'd rather run from it. And you got to understand, according to these verses. 
do what the Lord wants you to do even to your own hurt. I like that. Amen. That's what Jesus did. Amen. He did what the Father told him to do. He did what he knew he was supposed to do even to his own hurt. That's very true. That's good. Brother Scott, your hands up. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. I would say, uh, think back off of that, even sacrifices, everything that you have to, to commit to what you believe in. Okay. What you tell now, how about when somebody do you wrong? How do you show yourself to be mature in that kind of situation? Because, see, that situation right there is the very thing that makes people cut off their own growth. Because if somebody do me wrong, then it's hard for me to, to put that in the light of God's sovereignty, right? And so then I handle that situation wrong, but yet I'm still walking around proclaiming that I'm wrong. Go ahead. Your hand is up. Why we are talking about 
about maturity. Because until we are mature, we are not going to know how to handle situations like that. Yes? I think it's important as well that like you said, when, when God shows us things like that, it's a deficit that's in us. It's something that we didn't have, whether it was in our childhood or whether it was whatever, but we are making, we are trying to get people to fulfill a void that is not going to be, they're never going to be able to measure up. They're never going to fill that gap, you know. And so sometimes you have to realize that that insecurity that you're dealing with, that you have, is not dependent on anybody else but you. Right. And you got to deal with that. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's the reason why we are talking about maturity. Because a mature child of God understands that Christ is their all in all. Right? And so I'm not looking to you for validation. I'm not looking to you for friendship. I'm not looking to you for any of that. I actually come in here because I am actually a con I want to be a conduit. I want to be one that comes to people and encourages people in the name of Christ. Not going to people and trying to get encouragement, but to be an encouragement. Amen? And that's, that is the way that the church is supposed to be. Uh, because of the fact that it's enough discouraging things going on. And, and if a person comes in and they treat you a certain way, don't take it personal. I remember I was out with my pastor one time. We was, we was down on Marshall, down on Marshall Street somewhere. And, uh, no, we was on Airy. We was on Airy Street. And I remember us going into this house. And we was talking to this one lady. And she got really indignant and put us out of her house. And I remember as we was stepping on the other side of her house, my pastor turned around and said, listen, I want you to understand, she was a member of our church. He said, I want you to understand that she slammed the door in his face. I mean, slammed it so hard that the windows and everything shook while he was standing there. And I said, man, that's horrible that she would do that. You know, that's really horrible. He looked at me and he said, Brother Bruce, don't ever take anything personal. Now, at that point, I was a very immature Christian. I'm about ready to grab a brick and throw it through her window because I felt that was terrible, that she would do that to the pastor. But those words that he said to me that day stuck. Don't ever take anything personal. It stuck because I felt like it challenged me. You know, it, it challenged me because at that time, I took everything personal. I'm, I'm the baby of nine, you know, so everybody always looked after me. I didn't have to worry about nothing, you know. Uh, if anybody bothered me, I had a whole clan coming at your house, and that's just the way that was. So it was hard for me not to take things personal. But when he said that, it was a challenge. And it was almost like I knew that I was going to have to go through some stuff in order for the Lord to cultivate that in my life. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Much of the adversity that I went through in my life was so that the Lord could bring me to a place where I didn't take stuff personal. And that was a hard process. It is one thing to teach it. But it's another thing entirely to have to live it. But I've seen so many Christians cut their own growth because of the fact that adversity came and instead of them learning how to stand through it, they ran from it. And that is the thing that you're going to do. You either want to stand through it or you want to run from it. And, that, and the choice really is about where your relationship with God is. Amen? So, back to Jake. I saw another hand. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good to see you, brother, man.
he definitely had to suffer. Amen? And he suffered for you and I. And the Bible says that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And that is really something because it's the same thing with us. The way that we learn obedience is through suffering. It's through adversity. Nobody wants to suffer. Everybody talks about, I'm praying that God will grow me up spiritually. But then when God begins to do it, people start running. Because they had a misunderstanding of what spiritual growth entails. There is no spiritual growth without adversity. That is the thing that God uses to grow us up. When you run from adversity, you are really saying, I don't want it. I don't want growth. Now if it's going to come like this, well, then you don't want it because that's the only way it's going to come. Growth only comes through adversity. Amen? And I'm talking about adversity from people. I'm talking about adversity from a lack of something or, you know, I'm talking about any way that God brings adversity to your life is always for one reason. This is why the Bible says that we are to rejoice in, during diverse temptations. That we are to rejoice. We don't rejoice because we're happy that something bad is happening to us. We rejoice because we understand the end result of it. I think it was Job that said, he knows the way that I take. When he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. It's something because it was almost like Job was rejoicing where he was because he understood that at the end of this, I'm going to come forth as gold. The only thing that God is doing is purifying me. That's all he's doing. This is a purification of my gold. That's all it is. And so when he had tried me, I should come forth as gold. Now, one more thing I want to show you, and then we're done. Look down to verse number five. Yes, sir. Ephesians. I told you to turn to Ephesians. Did I read? Did I not read Ephesians? Ephesians 4. Uh, did I read Ephesians 4 13? Okay. So, yes, yeah, so now we're back to James chapter 1. Yes, sir. Back to James chapter 1. And verse number 3. Verse number 5, I'm sorry. James 1 and 5. I don't know why that 5 looks like a 3 to me. <laughs> Be quiet, Charity. It says in, in James 1 and 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Take that and put it in its context. What is it talking about? Take that verse right there and put it in the context of James chapter 1. What is that talking about? Wisdom to do what? What is it talking about? Anybody? It's like Simba. Anybody? Somebody? <laughs> huh? Wisdom to endure. Exactly. That's what it's talking about. Wisdom to endure. It's talking about that when if you lack wisdom, in other words, if you don't know how to go through situations the right way, pray. And ask God to help you, to give you wisdom to go through the situation the right way. But of course, if we are immature, we are never going to see God because an immature Christian does not do that. The immature Christian will look within and let things bother them instead of taking a situation to God and say, God, help me to go through this the right way so that I can bring you glory and not allow it to sour me. Right? But that's what it's all about. So the Bible says if we lack wisdom, let, let us ask of God. Lord, please give me wisdom in this situation. And you can pray that fast. You don't have to close your eyes and bow your head in the midst of the situation. In your head, you can say, Lord, please help me. Because right now, I want to react the wrong way, but I know that's not what you want me to do. I know you don't want me to react that way. So please help me. Show me what I need to do, and then give me the strength to do it. Amen? Now, are there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay, so understanding that many times God brings adversity into our lives in order to grow us. Because if we 
argument. If we don't grow, then we're not going to understand, we're not going to know how to go through uh, conflict situations. Conflict resolution always starts with your relationship with God. It starts in that place where you understand the importance of adversity. Adversity does not always come from other people. Sometimes it comes from other places. But it is God growing you up and getting you ready for service. Because until you have matured, you are not quite ready for service. This is why I really have a hard time when people say, well, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I go, I don't know if you're ready for it. Because if you get into service before you're ready, then we are once again going to have a situation where there is a ministry that is not being manned because the person that was manning it wasn't mature. Amen? And there have been so many times where First Lady had to go and try to figure out how to carry something because somebody started something in enthousi with enthusiasm in it. They was ready to go, but they didn't have what it took to carry it through. A mature Christian understands that they have to sit down first of all and count the cost before they start going down that road. Because sometimes that cost is going to be heavy. Amen? It's going to be heavy. I'm not even going to say sometimes. Whatever it is that God has laid on your heart to do, that cost is going to be heavy. It is going to get real heavy. Amen? And if you haven't learned the importance of walking with God the way that you need to, you're going to fall beneath the weight. Amen? And so I, there's, there's another group of people that says, well, that's why I don't want to do nothing. And they don't even understand as well that, again, they are stuck in their own growth. Amen? So you say, then what, do I, what should I do, preacher? What you need to do? You need to get in a right relationship with God. So then the Lord can begin to take you through situations that will help you to grow. And then as you learn the importance of growing, then when, when, uh, when situations come where you're in conflict, you will know exactly what to do. And it, you will not be walking around thinking that everybody is against you and all the stuff that the enemy is trying to put in your mind. But this is why we also read the verse to talk about that you won't be carried around, carried away with every one of doctrine. Um, because that's exactly what happens. Whatever the enemy puts in your mind, you run with it. Whether it's true or false, it doesn't really matter. This is what I believe. This is what I think I see. And then I run with it. And I wanted to say something else. Yeah. I wanted to say something else about it. Because, because this is the thing that happens. Then you begin to, and I, I know I talk about it, but gossip really is the number one enemy of conflict resolution. It truly is. That is the number one enemy of conflict resolution. You cannot have conflict resolution when you have gossip. And I feel like I'm jumping around a little bit, but I think y'all understand where I'm coming from, right? Um, you can't have conflict resolution when you have gossip. It's impossible. Amen? It is, it is impossible. It truly is. Um, if I go to other people and talk about Brother Tommy, then the thing is, I may be able to resolve my issue with Brother Tommy, but now I have put into your mind something about Brother Tommy that you see every time you see him. And no matter what I say to you, I can come to you and say, you know what, Miss Angela, I was wrong about what I said about Brother Tommy. And Miss Angela looking at me and go, no, you're not, because I see exactly what you was talking about. You wasn't wrong. Because I see it. I, I see that he's a buzzer. He's not, I'm just saying. I see that, I see Brother Tommy is a buzzer. You wasn't wrong at all. Amen. And, uh, and that's what happens, is that when you separate real good friends because of something that you said to somebody else about another individual. If you really want to know how much you grow, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take a litmus test. I want you to say to yourself, how do I respond to gossip? That's going to really help you to understand where you are spiritually. Do you engage in gossip? Do you talk about other people? Do you listen to other people talking about other people? That is a telltale sign of where you are spiritually. Amen? Y'all hear me? Amen. Don't ever think that a person that's coming to you, they're coming to you 
because they need to vent. There's not that much venting in the world. That's why we have something that's called prayer. Because that's what we're supposed to vent in our prayer closet to God. Amen? That's, that's your venting station. Go there and vent. Don't be venting to other people because then you are poisoning them. Amen? Amen. And you separate good friends. I've lost some good friends. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to celebrate 23 years of ministry this summer, and I've lost some good friends only because of something that somebody else said about me to another individual that wasn't true or could have been true. It doesn't really matter. But instead of the individual coming to me, they ain't never seen me do what the person that accused me of. They ain't never seen it. But it doesn't really matter. Because of their connection to the person that told them, it doesn't really matter whether they seen it or not. They're going to automatically take the other person's side. And now me and the other person, they're made up and got it right. And now the people that they don't went to can't stand my guts. And they don't even know me. They don't even know me. Isn't that something? You say, what are you doing in those kind of situations? Absolutely nothing. I keep on keeping on, keep on moving forward, and keep on serving God. Amen? If I see them, I still speak, and I try to treat them just like I would if everything was cool. Amen? That's always what I want to do. But the thing is, you can't make people like you. But don't allow the enemy to put in your mind that everybody hates you. Because then you become unlikable. All right. You do. Amen. You come in here with frowning, with attitude, because of the fact that you think that everybody in the church don't like you. Now, you can't get along with nobody. I want to befriend you, but every time I try to befriend you, you, you tell me to go fly 